Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first live version of our In Context Conversation. The title of this morning's session is The Evolution of Cryptocurrency. As a way of introduction, my name is Greg Leonberger. I am the Director of Research here at Marquette Associates, and joining me is our crypto and digital asset resident and expert, Nick Selecki. Now, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. We have left plenty of time at the end of this morning's session for questions and answers. I encourage you to ask anything that is on your mind. This is really meant for you, our clients, our listeners. And if there's something that you're curious about, please go ahead and ask it. And the next question is, well, how do I ask a question? Well, it's very straightforward. Use the chat feature here on Teams to submit any questions. Nick and I will see all the questions that come in and we will cover as many as we can at the end. And furthermore, we have gotten a lot of questions from clients over the last couple of years about crypto. So if there is a lack of questions, not enough questions from live audience members, we can cover some topics which have been asked in the past, past and quite honestly, I think are really value add points to, 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 uh, to take away from this morning's conversation. The next point to make before we jump into the material is that the, the, the goal of this session, and I'm going to call this a conversation this morning between Nick and myself, is really to help all of you understand more about crypto. By no means is it, is it an endorsement for putting crypto into your portfolios. Please do not go run out and buy Ethereum or Bitcoin simply as a result of the hour you spend with us this morning. But we do want all of you to have a better understanding of, of what crypto is, how it works, and how it can be placed into portfolios where appropriate. So with all that out of the background, we're going to jump into this. And this will be a back and forth with, with me asking the questions and, and Nick providing the answers. And to kind of set the table here, there are two observations or data points that we want to share and have Nick talk a little bit about and, and talk about, uh, at least on this first one, some parallels between the early years of crypto and the early years of something that we use uh, as part of our everyday lives, the internet, which, which profoundly changed our lives. And again, this is not to suggest that crypto could have life-changing uh, impact uh, on, on all of our lives, but but who knows? Crypto is very young. So this is the point in the conversation where I stopped talking and asked Nick to really sp spend a, just a, a minute or two talking about the parallels he sees between the early years of the internet and the early years of crypto. So Nick, take it from here. Hey, Greg, thank you. Um, first, before I jump in, everybody, thank you for joining us. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And if I talk too quick, it's because my adrenaline is at 11. This is my first presentation. Um, your time is valuable. We want to make the most of it and we really appreciate you joining. So to kick it off, what you're looking at simply in the top row is internet adoption trends from 1993 to present day. And then the lower half, you have global crypto adoption from its inception around 2010. It started a little bit before that, but you can see that it was pretty flatlined through current day or 2021 to 2022. And the key takeaway in this chart, if nothing else, is that there is some commonality in the trajectory in how growth is or how people are adopting to crypto, similar to how they adopted the internet. The scale is different, but the trajectory is similar. So the early years of the internet, early years of crypto bear some resemblance. I think that's really a nice way to open up the conversation today. The second item I wanna talk about real briefly, Nick, is is I think a lot of us have probably gotten some type of email over the years saying, your email has been hacked, uh, in order for me not to release all this personal secret information about your life, you need to pay me and you need to pay me in crypto. And there are other narratives out there that cryptocurrencies have been used to fund terrorism, to fund drug dealing. And I think this has faded a little bit, but but I think that there's this assumption that that a large majority or perhaps maybe not a large majority, but a significant percentage of transactions done via cryptocurrency are for illicit activity. I know you pulled a lot of data from here. Some of this data is in front of us as we look at the screen. Could tease us out, tease us out a little bit and, and let me know kind of is that a right assumption, a wrong assumption about the, the amount of crypto being used to fund illicit activity? So there's a lot of misinformation space. Crypto, Bitcoin, whatever you go call it, whatever you want to call it, there is a colored history. And that's a trend that's similar across most new technologies, from the automobile uh, to war bonds of 1787 or U.S. Treasuries. Um, that is a trend that's played out, and Bitcoin definitely had that issue up to about 2012. There was a thing called the Silk Road. The FBI shut it down, and that was when things started to change. In 2017, a firm called Chainalysis, which is, consists of a lot of programmers that ended up trying to develop the original uh, code for Bitcoin and other coins, they wanted to enable... They wanted to help facilitate governments, regulators, or anyone 
um, using leveraging the transparency of blockchains to really see where things were going because it isn't like a dollar. If I hand someone a dollar and it's gone, the blockchain has a record. All you have to do is be able to follow the chain and know how to read it. So over time, illicit activity on the crypto or on in crypto in general has decreased. Currently, as of 2021, less than half a percent of all crypto activity is illicit. Another way of saying that is 90, at least 99.5 percent is legitimate. There is some room for error, and judging back on how we have learned new things later on and amended prior figures, currently, if we were to amend upward, conservative estimate would be less than a percent of crypto activity is illicit. And that's the real takeaway for this slide: that that it's a very very small percentage that has been found to be used for illicit activity. Now we're going to back up here and start a little more bigger picture and talk through some of the basic terms which can help build some intuition and increase knowledge sets for, for crypto. But we like to leave with those two pages. Number one, to show that, that crypto and, and digital assets are in their very early years, but the rise in popularity, even those early years, suggests that there is staying power here. And then also addressing the, I think one of the primary concerns we hear from clients is that, well, I'm not sure if I want to touch crypto because of, of, the, of what is used for, and there's not a lot of transparency. And, and there are other concerns which we will touch, touch on as well. And, and again, this is not meant to be an endorsement of crypto, but really just to, to help understand it. Now, the terminology here, there are, there, are, there are a lot of terms here. We are not going to define every one of these because the, the following pages are going to cover each one of these in a bit more, bit more depth. But the one definition which I'd like to spend a, a little bit of time with when we start up these conversations is Bitcoin itself. And Bitcoin, as all of you probably here on the call are at least familiar with Bitcoin, knowing that it, it is the, the largest blockchain-based cryptocurrency and really the first successful one. It was launched in 2008. And my favorite statistic in, in all of the... Of the crypto presentations we do is, is talking about the first transaction that ever took place using Bitcoin. And that was completed on May 22nd, 2010. So almost exactly 12 years ago, two Papa John's pizzas were purchased. I believe this was in the state of Florida. 10,000 Bitcoins were used to purchase these two pizzas. At that point in time, that was good for $41. Well, as time has gone on, Bitcoin has skyrocketed in value. And today, those two pizzas cost about $400 million. So that shows what has happened so quickly with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general. So it, it, with that, as it, just a little bit of background on, on how quickly cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, of course, being one type of cryptocurrency, have grown. And all of these cryptos are based on a technology called blockchain technology. And it's really important to understand kind of what a blockchain is and how it works, because that really is the foundation for all cryptocurrencies and digital assets for that matter. So Nick, why don't you spend a couple of minutes talking about blockchains, kind of what they are and how they operate. All right, I can do you one better. I can do this in about 20 seconds. There's a lot you can read here. I'm gonna to stick to the high level because I want you all to keep it as simple as you can. What are blockchains? Blockchains are digitally distributed ledgers of account, similar to an accounting ledger that you would see on paper, shared and reconciled by a network of computers. Because it's distributed across that network, it's distributed. The interesting point that will go next is how they work. Transfers or transactions on a blockchain network are executed by authorized computer systems called nodes. So in real time, all of these computers are talking to each other and they have to reach a defined amount of agreement as to what the ledger says, how the transaction occurred, and they record it. Next slide, please. One question we get is, or one comment I hear is people say, I believe in blockchain technology, but I don't like cryptocurrency. And it hurts my soul to hear that. The reason is blockchains require both a native unit of account and an incentive for individuals or groups to operate on the network. And that was the key reason cryptocurrencies came into existence. They could use a dollar, but you can't control the dollar because obviously it's issued by the treasury. If you issue a cryptocurrency, you now have some sort of token that you can use to incentivize people to take on the cost of running a node, whether it's energy, time, both of those being things we compensate for. Next slide, please. Why crypto exchanges exist is a natural next step to that, because if there's a primary network of nodes and computers talking, people are transacting with each other, that's great. But why do we have all the exchanges and speculation you might see in the markets today? Digital exchanges are the secondary markets for cryptocurrencies, and they were initially developed solely for liquidity and to simplify the purchases and transfers of those cryptos. 
Um, there's a bunch of people trading between each other. A lot of them are programmers. They might be able to read green screen. Most of us cannot. I know I can't. So these exchanges came about to help facilitate that and make it a little bit easier for users. Naturally, what followed, any financial professional tell you in the markets, people will see an opportunity, whether it be for high risk, high reward, um, possible, I guess, so fundraising or crowdsourcing for funds similar to equity raises, or they're going to look and see just a means to speculate. Hey, we think something could appreciate in value or the opposite, they could short it and go and think it's going to decline and ride both waves of that. And that is in essence why we have the secondary markets we do today. And Nick, I think that's a point really worth repeating that that cryptocurrencies as an investment. Cryptocurrencies were not originally designed to be an investment. They were designed simply to motivate participants to, to use the blockchain to, to validate transactions and the secondary market obviously has exploded. And Nick, before going on to the timeline, I want to loop back for just a second and talking about blockchain ledger and the security of, of the blockchain ledger, because the question I think some listeners may have is, OK, this is all done on a computer, but can't someone go in and hack the blockchain and then alter the code to give themselves a, a bunch of bitcoins and make themselves rich overnight just because they're good at computer programming. Spend just you know 30 seconds a minute talking about the security of the blockchain ledger and the fact that you have all these, these nodes or users distributed across the world who develop consensus, which, which by that very nature makes it impossible for someone to come in and hack the blockchain. Fantastic question. So cryptography was introduced in the 90s um, after once civilian purposes were able to utilize it, it was controlled by NATO and the U.S. for a very long time. Um, so you have a number of nodes across the across the world. That's a global system, just like the internet. And there's a divine majority that have to come to consensus to change, or, or let's say a hacker comes in and wants to take some crypto off the network, or just reverse a transaction. To do that, the hacker would simultaneously have to hack more than 51% of all the nodes on the network. Now, if it's centralized and you have five computers, which did happen in the last two months it's easier to hack. In the case of Bitcoin um, or the XRP ledger too, you might see on the news, it's very improbable and very expensive. You would need a quantum computer to break through the cryptography alone, let alone hack the hundreds, if not thousands of nodes that are on that network in real time. So the more adoption goes onto a network actually makes it significantly harder to hack. With that point, similar to what we saw in the, the crime analogy or the crowd slime is that Blockchain networks don't have many cases of being hacked. Blockchain networks have proven pretty resilient. It's the centralized ones that show as being a weak point. The next step of that is the weak point comes down to exchanges. All the times we've heard about hacks or thefts of a sick amount of Bitcoin, they were all on exchanges because that was a weak point where somebody didn't or an entity didn't have the controls in place to make sure they were safeguarded. Let's talk a little bit about the timeline of crypto. I mentioned that the first one really launched in 2008 with Bitcoin. In some ways, it's only been 14 years. In some ways, it's been a long 14 years in terms of the evolution of crypto and how quickly things have changed. Again, a, a lot of a lot of images on here, a lot of dates on here, kind of big pictures as you talk through the, the timeline. What are, what are the most kind of notable developments along the way? So this is where we get to the fun stuff. If you're still with us, you made it through the wordiest of it. Now we got pictures. Bitcoin was invented in 2009, or sorry, it launched in 2009. It was under development for a very long time, but it, it was a, basically launched because a number of people had lost faith in our financial system and some of the parties in it after 2008 um, and their ability to work as a fiduciary for the markets. So they wanted to launch a network that was outside the control of malicious actors or just people that might not have everybody's interest at heart, but that also was sustainable and solved for risk. Two parties could transact with each other and it eliminated the risk of bouncing a check or fraud. Um, and it got pretty close, but after Bitcoin launched in 2009, a number of other coins followed suit. Most were very similar to it with modest changes in design or function like Litecoin. It's also a proof of work coin, um, but it had modest changes that made it more energy efficient. Um, Ripple Labs launched the XRP ledger at the time, I think it was a file coin was the name of the company. They launched a ledger and their entire goal was to make a network for immenses that worked within the financial system that brought everybody around. They had, were the first example that I'm aware of that had very significant changes to the code and operated a different way. And after 2012, it starts to pick up quicker and quicker and quicker. Um, if you haven't seen the Doge, now you have the Doge coin. It came out 
in late 2013. It was a meme coin. It was made by some friends that were making fun of each other and the markets. They simply wanted to make fun of each other for speculating. And so they made a coin. Um, since then, we've had a number of other ones show up. We have Tether. That's a stable coin. Um, it doesn't fluctuate much in value. Ethereum came on the scene and wait. I'm trying to read my line here. Around 2016. I believe that might be incorrect. That might be supposed to be 2015. 2017 was the big moment you all might know in the news because that's when this started getting a lot of traction in the news and in the media. There was an ICO boom. Valuations went through the roof. Bitcoin went close to $10,000. More than 800 ICOs happened in about a year and a half's time. So uh, there was a massive influx of capital and a lot of people coming in for good and bad reasons. And since then, that kind of marked the stage we were in. After 2018, we went into a bit of a lull. The market fell off hard and didn't really do anything until what we see today. Hey, Nick, maybe just define what ICO is for some people unfamiliar with the acronym. ICO is an initial coin offering. If any of our equity friends in the room are thinking, man, that sounds pretty similar to an IPO, it really does. And that's exactly one of the first things that got the attention of the United States SEC um, because people were using it to crowdsource funds. So there's a, this, there is a theme here that you'll notice, whether you're working fixed income equities, you're a fiduciary, you're on a board, any sort of thing or whatever your passion is, there's commonalities to almost every equity or asset class in here, especially equities, but it's not a one for one tip. So if you can learn those other spaces, you can absolutely learn crypto. All right. Nick, go ahead and spend a minute about talking about how cryptocurrency has generally evolved into the broader definition of digital assets. Cryptocurrency was the term that kind of went with Bitcoin. At the time, Bitcoin was a loan was the, was the lone crypto out there. But as it evolved and the space grew between 2009 and today, more than 8,000 coins have emerged with various designs and functions, most of them nothing like Bitcoin. I think more than two thirds are actually nothing like Bitcoin by design, function, or use. So this heat map on the right kind of gives you an idea of how complex the space could appear if you're not versed in it and how overwhelming it can be. With that, it, the space has been rebranded in a way that's a little more conducive, one, for understanding, but also for investment. If people were to come in this space or just to use the primary markets, it's easier if you can digest it. Digital assets has been put forth as the name for an asset class. So if you're to think of all of it together, all 8,000 or more, digital assets is the name to go with. They're intangible because they're digital. They're blockchain-based assets that are generally used as mediums of exchange, units of account, or stores of value. Those three bullets, surprisingly encompass quite a bit of different use cases, but those are the three that you can really lean on and point to as what would define a digital asset. And like any broad classification in the world of investments in financial markets, we can be more granular and more specific and we can go as deep as we want. So, so next two pages, the first one is kind of a broader view, a broader breakdown of digital assets. And then the second one is a more granular view. So so Nick, again, as, as you think through this and think about the different uses and the different types of digital assets, break it down for us in terms of, again, like the, the bigger picture category categories and then more specific. All right. So like any asset class, we have different subgroups. The picture on the right, you'll see digital currencies, computational platforms, and financial instruments. Those are three subgroups that have been put out there as most of these assets, if not like 90% of them, you can group into these categories in some way, shape, or form. Bitcoin, XRP, central bank digital currencies, which you'll come, I'll kind of introduce in the next slide, those would fall into your digital currencies. Your computational platforms would be your names like Ethereum. They are a smart contract platform, a platform that other applications can be built on, and they actually overlap with financial instruments. Once smart contracts came about, a lot of people realized the lending process, all of these things that we use in financial services that are intuitive could be streamlined and you could cut out middlemen. And that's where the financial instrument piece came in. Um, the key, one key point here I would like to drive home, anybody here who's been a student of the markets, can you go back one slide, please? Yep. Anybody who's been a fan of the markets or who, was up on your, like say, equity market history, intrinsic value was introduced by Graham and Dodd with security analysis, and it's been expanded on for the, about the last century or better part of the last century. Prior to that, it was tea leaves and gut feelings and, and a lot of speculation. In the 30s, a lot of people referred to equities if you were to take a conversation about crypto today, all the negative aspects of it, it'd be strangely similar to a conversation people in fixed income may have about that crazy equity market that just caused the Great Depression, along with some debt. Cryptos differ where they don't have intrinsic value. 
some might have cash flow argument. Let's keep it simple. They offer extrinsic value, instrument value. They're meant to be used. They're meant to streamline something. So they have a use case, utility. That's where it all starts. What problem are they solving? And from there, you can measure adoption, sustained use, network development, supply, demand. There's a number of ways, more than I can count, on how you can measure these things, value them. Some of the valuation models are debated, but that's part of the natural growth of an asset class. People are going to debate these things and come up with a system. All right. So with that, based on all the use cases that have come out there on this extrinsic value concept, there are a number of ways these can be deployed. You can have cryptocurrencies, central bank digital currencies, um, exchange tokens, which would actually be used on your digital exchanges. They're a native token to those exchanges. You can also have something like a DeFi token or a tokenized asset. One question that gets asked a lot is, will this have any impact on capital markets? And the short answer is yes, it can absolutely digitize and rework the plumbing of our markets. You could put a receipt on the ledger that's supposed to resemble an equity, a house, a car. You all have seen NFTs in the news. Those are tokenized assets and they can come in any shape or form. And that's why this flywheel has been spread out. This by no means the all encompassing wheel. Um, I do have to give credit. Um, Van Eck and the digital asset review kind of came up with the first versions of this and I adapted it to simplify it because this, you can go as deep as the, in the rabbit hole as you want to go. But that is a flywheel you can rely on. And I hope that you guys can have some time later in your day or later in the month to review that and kind of familiarize yourself with it. The top 10 digital assets are on this list for you. There's a number of different types in here. Um, we're not gonna spend too much time on this, but I did want to give you a little glimpse at the market as I could. Those top 10 assets encompass about 77% of the entire market. So a $2 trillion market, 77% of that about is in the top 10. Um, so if you were to look at the top 10, 20, 30, maybe 50, that's where most of the value is. But there's a number of coins and networks being developed every day for different reasons. Nick, this has been a really good summary of, of kind of crypto and how it's evolved into digital assets and then the top digital assets. And we can't have a conversation about crypto and digital assets without talking about prices and price behavior. But alluded to it a little bit. I think that again, circling back to that pizza example and the price of what uh, 10,000 bitcoins was worth in 2010 versus what it's worth 12 years later. I think that that underscores the growth and explosion you've seen in prices, but also the volatility. And we have more on the risk return profile of, of, of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies later on in this conversation. But just to touch on it here, maybe opening comments and the big takeaways as it relates to, to crypto and token prices. On the left, you have cryptocurrencies, two examples of them anyway, Bitcoin, XRP. On the right, you have two leading smart contract platforms. And you can, the prices tell you a little bit, but somebody might just look at the chart and go, wow, that's volatile, and they would be right. I added in a 100-day, 180-day moving average to give you a, a baseline, something you could judge it to. Is it over, undervalued relative to the mean? And there's a number of ways you can use it. The 180-day value is not um, etched in stone is what you have to use, but it's just one way you could do it. Um, for the next few slides, I'm going to try and keep these to 20 seconds just to be conscious of time, so we're going to move pretty quick. Ethereum and smart contracts. I've enabled, I've talked about this a few times. The chart on the right gives you an idea of how it solves for a problem. Traditional contracts have, if you've ever worked with a lawyer or an insurance agency, when people try to make a contract, there's a lot of intermediaries. Um, contracts take time. It can take weeks. It can take months. And there's a lot of fees that accrue in there. Smart contracts streamline that. They do for contracts and finance what the internet did for data and communication. You have a digital exchange, your execution can take seconds, minutes, maybe hours. And I mean that literally, we're not talking days or weeks, seconds, minutes, or hours, and your costs are reduced and they're transparent. Next slide, please. So with lending or so with smart contracts, decentralized finance is the DeFi buzzword you may see on the news. I wanted to look, give you this chart here to give you ideas that DeFi is not a crazy concept. It's a very fun word. It can be intimidating, but it's just a digital variant of everything you know with banking, lending, borrowing, checking, savings, asset management, um, tokenizing assets, stable value, concepts that you all have written and read books on. That's all this is, it digitizes them. Next slide, please. 
Now we get to get some really fun charts. DeFi adoption is probably the number one source of adoption globally with digital assets, at least at this time, it's most pronounced. And the US run has the lead in it in terms of dollar values and, and businesses, but it is skewed. It has significant adoption across the world of the planet. But when you look at other currencies and then like microtransactions and values of say the rupee, it isn't apples to apples in terms of dollar value. So the US is pronounced here and we have a top 10 chart of some of the countries that have the most adoption. One key note with that is it tends to be Southeast Asia at this point in time, and it does expand into Oceania and a little bit further towards India and the Middle East. Consumer adoption, this is broad consumer adoption, not DeFi. Consumer adoption has been most profound in frontier and emerging markets because the primary networks cater to use cases that change lives in those markets. Um, if you've ever used a MoneyGram or Western Union, you know that there's a five to twenty dollar fee for sending money. Um, for some of these remittance platforms that are, that are actively deployed and being used by companies and consumers, say in India, the Philippines, Japan, they settle. They don't pay. You send a payment, it settles in less than five seconds, and the cost is one thousandth of a penny. For someone who's working and making twenty dollars a week, that is absolutely massive and life changing. Next slide, please. Con commercial adoption and appeal. Some names here you may recognize. Deloitte had a 2021 survey on blockchain, just asking institutions, uh, what role will digital assets have in your organization? Some hadn't adopted it yet, some have. And this list gives you an idea of what they were talking about, what boardrooms and executives were looking at when exploring this space. So Nick, we've seen the growth really across the world it's 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 varied and it's grown more in some in, in some regions of the world than others you're seeing consumers embrace it more you're seeing companies allow payment via crypto but what about the institutional world after all we're an institutional investment consulting firm we work with institutional clients we work we work with high net worth clients and i based on our conversations uh, my takeaway is that it's been kind of a varied take up or disparity amongst different types of investors um, across the country. So spend a minute or two to shedding some light on, on what you're seeing in terms of, of who's investing in it now, where is it more common, where is it less common? All right, so right now it has, the survey actually extends far beyond the United States and included the United States, um, Asia broadly and Europe. And it's adoption for the last few years has kind of been in the venture capital space. Obviously, someone has to fund some of these projects for them to get off the ground. So that was a natural source of capital and a natural place for people to go. What blew me away was that 100% of the respondents said that they were in it, and that wasn't something that you would see on the news. That was a pretty profound number. Since then, um, you, as you imagine, across institutional clients, those who don't have the same red tape that others may have and some that can move a bit quicker like family offices they tend to be the first to adopt they're very pronounced in europe they're significantly pronounced in the us but europe did have an edge in the asian markets uh apac they had a lot of family offices and they actually have the most announced or pronounced amount of financial advisors pushing this so we are going to go through these next slides. We like we want to borrow five minutes, but I guarantee you all will like it because we are going to touch on volatility and that should get somebody's interest. On this institutional note, this breaks out across US, Europe and Asia, some of the different trends such as venture capital, financial advisors, high net worth. Um, one question I get is why Taft Hartley clients haven't exactly come into the space and one simple answer is there aren't many vehicles that are conducive to that or at least before Fidelity's announcement there wasn't. The other part of that is that those are, those uh, fiduciaries, those parties, the boards, they have a whole different set of risk uh, criteria. So I would anticipate those kind of being one of the later groups to really move into the space because they don't need to be the first mover to benefit from adoption. Um, endowments and foundations can move a little bit quicker, and that has actually stepped up significantly since this survey was released. I can't put it to a number, but I, I if I had to bet money, I would say probably at least doubled in the last year alone. Institutional appeals and concerns. And thank you, Jennifer, I see your question. We will absolutely get to that. Thank you. Institutional appeal and concerns, high potential upside. So capital appreciation is one play that gets people's attention. Innovative tech plays, you know, especially as growth tapers off. That's something that has its top of mind. 
an uncorrelated asset. I do have charts on that. And that is something that shows merit. With that, there are many concerns and headwinds. Um, volatility was the most pronounced in the, Fidel in the Deloitte survey. It was a very head big driver in the Fidelity survey as well. Custody, who holds it for you where you know it's safe? That's a very simple infrastructure issue that we're accustomed to with equities and we need to have the same process. And, and as, as in my role as, as director of research, one of my primary responsibilities is overseeing all the asset allocation studies that, that go out our door and meeting with a lot of our clients to talk about the asset allocation uh, for their portfolios and risk return profile. And the volatility is really a big one. And the, and the other one too, which which I is will naturally get better over time is this, the simple fact that this is still a very new investment and, and there's a lot of immaturity to the behavior of, of the underlying securities. And I, I think that that will, will will fade a bit as time goes on what that ultimately looks like from a long-term risk return profile and data series. No one really knows, but I can tell you those are two, two of the probably the, the, uh, the bigger headwinds cited by some of our clients. With all that said, I, I, we, we certainly want to spend some more time talking about what these returns look like and what the risk looks like. I think everyone has heard those anecdotal stories of, of uh, you know, the college kid who took 20 bucks from his grandmother invested in Bitcoin back in 2010, and then now they're sitting on uh, millions of dollars. The, again, the pizza example underscores that as well. But, but Nick, again, from a pretty high level, talking about risk and return, volatility of cryptocurrencies, we have a lot of charts in here. But the bigger picture takeaways as we walk, as we as we kind of work through these, what are those for our listeners? Absolutely. For everybody submitting questions, I am keeping tabs on these, and they will be front and center once we get out of the slides. And I will hit on these, Mr. Henrik. Thank you. Yes, you are right. Some of these slides can be dated. Assessing and collecting this data in real time, as you can see from the standard deviation chart, can be a lot. So. At some point when we were making this chart, we kind of had to cut a line because I felt like every day you'd have something new. And if we kept updating every day, we would never get something out. So we did have to draw a line. With the standard deviation, this chart right here is gonna tell you something you already know. It can be volatile. What I wanna tell you is on the next slide, and that's why it's volatile. Bitcoin or any other crypto. Bitcoin is the most capitalized crypto, so we use it as an example, and everything else is just a more severe case of this. They are thinly traded assets in shallow markets. Compared to equities or fixed income, they're illiquid, or relatively illiquid. So with that, you get volatility. Um, one person can tip the scales of supply and demand significantly. One large purchase or sale can cause a sell-off event. In 2012, you can see around the time um, Bitcoin had its first significant increase in value from, say, the single digits to the two or three digits. That was a, you had this massive run up and then you had a massive sell off. However, as Bitcoin is capitalized, as you see in this chart from left to right, you have your red, your yellows, your slightly darker yellow, and then your green, you'll see that as it became more capitalized, there has been a steady trend of risk or volatility decreasing. Now it's still more pronounced and it's exceptional compared to any other asset class, but it is decreasing stabilizing. And this falls in suit with a lot of things we've seen, not only just in economic market dynamics, but an analysis done by the SEC, say, on thinly traded assets in shallow markets with international small cap stocks. Next slide, please. Drawdowns. So this chart right here gives an example of some of the different drawdowns over the past 10 years and what was happening at that time. If you see on the right, there's a pretty pronounced guy. You might be wondering, what was that? Without giving too many details, that was an eccentric billionaire on a social media platform who didn't like ESG of Bitcoin and it led to a sell-off event. And that's an example of what happens when one individual can tip the supply uh, dynamics and the demand dynamics of an entire market when it's thinly traded and in a shallow market. Liquidity is the key to flipping that. Next slide, please. And, and Nick, just to jump in here for, for a minute, again, getting the idea of broader portfolio management, right? And it's okay if, if, if an asset class is volatile. Now, I, I would argue that crypto is, 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 is you know, the extreme end of that. But we talk about diversification a lot, and diversification being kind of the, the primary um, means of, of, of uh, mitigating risk in market drawdowns or making sure not all your assets class performance is, go, is going to one in, in times of stress. So the, the primary measure we use diversification is, is, is correlations. The anchors of, of almost all of our client portfolios in some way are composed of equities, bonds, and alternatives. So spend a minute or two talking through the, the correlation analysis you've done of crypto versus equities, bonds, and alternatives. So simply looking at annualized returns over the last 10 years, I, I wanted to see how the cards fell. And across 
the different asset classes using these indices as a broad bellwether. Um, there was times where it was completely uncorrelated or negatively correlated, and there were times where it almost moved in lockstep, but there's more to that story than it being correlated or not correlated. Long term, it's very, the correlation is weak at best. Depending the year and the business cycle, the correlations can ramp up. You'll see a similar trend on the next slide with fixed income and then subsequent side with alternatives, which we won't spend too much time on, but you can at least get the idea. That when there's an alignment of sentiment in these markets, it tends to lead to a high correlation. It's not profound, but it can often be pointed to as somebody saying, hey, this is over correlated or hey, it's not correlated. There's truth to both. It's a double edged sword. But in this case, the market isn't developed enough to be correlated to movements in the equities. What it is correlated to is sentiment and risk. So when people go risk off, when markets turn risk off and you have a sell off and say growthy tech stocks, you tend to have a similar sort of sentiment followed or mirrored in the Bitcoin or crypto markets. And, and I think what, 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 when we have these types of conversations about new asset classes or, or, or new ideas or, 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 or trends, uh, as an investment consultant, it's, it's our primary responsibility to touch on all the different angles, right? And I think we've done a nice job of that so far, but we have to talk about risk. We've talked about volatility and most would argue volatility and drawdown is kind of your primary measure of risk, but there are other risks that, that need to be incorporated as well. Um, some ESG related, some more just kind of specific market or idiosyncratic risks unique to that market. I know you have a couple pages in here, Nick, so I'm going to let you kind of run with the, the risks and take us through this conversation before we move on to wrapping up and, and, and then taking questions. All right. So ESG is one of the top concerns right now in concerning crypto networks. Bitcoin gets a lot of flack being proof of work. This is a very hard thing to chart because there's not a lot of data on it and there's not a lot of cohesive data. You have to really piecemeal it together. So what I try to do is normalize this in kilowatt hours. Um, these are the most recent estimates I could find as of 2022 with Bitcoin transit, uh, Bitcoin energy consumption per transaction. And then in green here or yellow, you will see some references, the average U.S. household, the average refrigerator, a dishwasher or Visa and MasterCard. If we're talking payments to payments, that is a highly relevant apples to apples comparison. And that is significant. The next slide, however, gives you hope. And that is the sustainable network leaders. There are sustainable networks out here. Crypto isn't going to kill the world. I can't speak for Bitcoin and they can always change or improve code. But there are a number of networks that are active in the markets currently that are more sustainable. Dogecoin made the list on pure accident, which is one reason why you may see it promoted by um, sustainably minded companies. That is a very unique supply and demand dynamic to kind of assess. It's fun. But in there, you also have something like the XRP ledger that is doing global remittances, and you can compare that to Visa or MasterCard. For reference to the prior chart, I include the dishwasher so you can see the scales. They do connect, but they're completely different. Next slide, please. And these are the last two slides. Summary of risks. Liquidity, liquidity is an issue. It's illiquid, it's thin, it's shallow, and that leads to extreme volatility. With that, a lot of people don't know the value how to properly value these, just like they don't know how to value a communications network or an internet application or intellectual property. Things that don't, and people have written, don't fall into a value investing framework. They require new systems and methods. And I'm excited to see those evolve. There's some softer risks on the next slide that you do need to consider, um, that you do need to consider, which actually tie into Miss um, Mustaway's question. There's market manipulation, there's regulatory uncertainty, and there's custody. Market manipulation, I think we touched on with an eccentric billionaire on the drawdown chart. Regulatory uncertainty, the U.S. is, is an outlier in this aspect that other countries such as Singapore, Canada, Australia, Switzerland, I can name a few, they have been given very clear guidance on how to play in the market, how to develop responsibly within um, the aspects or guide rails that the government sets out, but then also just for in basic investor protections. In the U.S., that hasn't happened. There's been a lot of talk on the news. Um, one I saw a few weeks back, uh, the chair of the SEC was on the news saying, we've given a clear framework, but he wouldn't say what the framework was or answer a simple question. And that's a problem. And when you're trying to develop a company and assume that risk, um, that space needs to evolve before we see the full force of the U.S. capital market unleashed in this space. With custody, federal deposit insurance doesn't yet cover uh, cryptos because it's debated if these are securities or not. And then also just as an exception, it hasn't been written in. It's very new relative to these laws. Um, so most we have a number of custodians. They have a number of insurance standards, most provided by uh, 
tabloids, but also they have new ways of storing it. You can store it on a digital exchange. You can store your crypto in a cold wallet, which is essentially, it looks like a thumb drive and it takes it offline. You can't hack something that isn't plugged in and live on the network. And that is what cold storage means. Hot storage, kind of like a being on the oven on a hot burner, it's on the internet, it's on an exchange, it's on the network that's live and running. When it comes off, it's then cold. This last page here is really just a landing spot for the presentation and, and a recap of, of what all the different pages covered. I, there's no need to go through this in any type of detail. I encourage listeners, or, or if you're listening to this via the recording, go back and review the pages as you would like. And I'd like to use the rest of our time to answer questions. I, Nick, I know, it's, I know you have some that have come in. There are probably more that are coming in. I'll pause here just for a second to, to encourage everyone listening right now to go ahead and submit any other questions. Anything is fair game. Uh, if there's anything you want to learn more about and, and would like Nick to cover, please go ahead and ask it right now. We're here to maximize your time, so don't be shy. Nick, I'll let we you take it from here. Awesome. Please fire away on the questions as you have them. I'm going to scroll through these and manage them. Um, Ms. Jennifer, you've been waiting a long time. Thank you for your patience. The DOL has frowned upon crypto. So the DOL letter, Fidelity released their remarks on it soon after their announcement. The DOL letter is very clear in exercising caution. However, it doesn't ban it and it doesn't prohibit it. So as a fiduciary might think, you need to have a very methodic process on how you approach the space if you decide to approach it. And the DOL's letter captured that very well. There's been a lot of market commentary, and I expect political commentary to pick up rapidly in the next few weeks as some of the implications as are fleshed out. Also, it is an election year, and these topics are going to get buzzed. They're going to get thrown at you quick. Um, the DOL, we're going to have a letter come out probably in the, I would say in the next week, I'd like to think, Greg, um, kind of yeah. some remarks and considerations on the Fidelity Bitcoin announcement, and we will touch on considerations for fiduciaries um, that relate to the DOL letter. Moving to the next question, Mr. Henry. So we so cold can still cold contracts is the question. Can they um, cold storage? Can they be at risk if they're involved with a smart contract like a, a ledger that's active on the network or always running? They can be. Um, I would actually need a whole other presentation and probably some programmers to explain some of the nuances there. The simple answer is yes, they can be at risk, but it's not the same as being on line or on a hot wallet. Um, how or why does Bitcoin use so much energy? Bitcoin uses a system called proof of work and proof of work relies on brute force computation, the power of mathematics to solve these problems or proofs. And initially it, it was a very simple ledger, but as these blocks all added up and the algorithm got exponentially longer, this is a very simple way of putting it. It got harder to compute and it takes more energy and more computers and all of that computation power is why you see the energy use you do. There are a number of proposals such as the Lightning Network to make it more energy efficient, but just like we can't change a network overnight, that has to be voted on by the validators in that network. Like basically everybody that runs a node gets a prompt to vote on how that they would like to see it, what they would like to see happen. They could shoot it down. They could adopt it. And those sort of improvements, just like with an application or your computer, or Microsoft, those are supposed to be the next wave that improves the process. Next question. How do we secure a copy of the slides along with the opportunity? So that I believe this will be published. Yep, we will publish this recording on our, on our website and YouTube channel. And we can, I believe we're going to email the presentation. If not, we will have a means for it to be accessible for you because there's a lot in there and I'd love for you all to have a chance to read it further. Yeah, I, I would just jump in here and say, and don't be shy about reaching out to, to, to Nick, to myself, or any of your contacts at Marquette Associates. We're happy to share this material with you. With, with that, um, if you reach out to your consultants about it and you have some questions, please send them pointed questions. We're always open to talk and discuss things further, especially if you have something relating to your needs. That's what we're here for. Uh, next question, valuation has been the most puzzling piece for some. Um, any thoughts on how Bitcoin got to almost 70,000? Is there an underlying framework? So in the, in the easiest sense, uh, yes, there is an aspect uh, of speculation, just like there is in commodities, futures, or equity markets. Um, so there is some speculation, there's some um, momentum behind people jumping on a bandwagon, such as growth, you can relate to that. Bitcoin did have a momentum aspect in the last two years. It is the most capitalized. It gets the most buzz in terms of name recognition. 
And it also, in an inflationary environment, gave people an alternative to holding a fiat currency where your purchasing power could be eroded. So a lot of people turn to it as a new means or just a new possibility in preserving value or wealth. Um, and with it being thinly traded and in a shallow market, it drives the price up quickly. With that, I don't know where it's going to settle. No one has a crystal ball. Um, but if that trend were to continue, it, it does suggest good things for the price and also for the volatility. However, the volatility will always be present and it's going to be most present without institutional investors in the space. Hey, hey, Nick, what would you say to someone who who wanted to explain, let's just say a decent portion of the run-up in prices, just due to the overall speculative environment we've lived in over the last couple of years, rates have been really low, there's been all kinds of stimulus, it's been really easy to get your hands on money to invest, and then every headline says, well, stock market's overvalued, of course, money still flowed into it, but then investors were looking for other opportunities and crypto was there and, and money flowed to crypto and drove the price up. But do you give, do you give uh, credence to that narrative and, or at least partial, partial credit to, to, to that dynamic for having helped fuel prices? I absolutely do. Um, crypto in general is democratizing capital markets. It's the next wave of efficiency or digitizing some of these old processes. But with that, because of the internet and everything you can do, you can have Google in the palm of your hand. People have the tools and resources to learn about markets and investing. Crypto, and this was where the secondary markets kind of took on a life of their own, was it gave everybody across the world that anybody with a phone and internet now has access to a potential investment vehicle. Whether you're betting on it like a currency or commodity to appreciate, or you think that that network could take off like a company, it was a whole new thing. And you don't have to be accredited to, to enter into the space, which does is a double bladed sword or a double bladed knife of its own because accredited investors are supposed to be knowledgeable. But sadly, one trend that has been observed is that most accredited investors are wealthy and they get access to things while other people don't never get the chance to play in it. That has had a profound effect. With that, you can't understate when you have, say, less informed or uninformed individuals just jumping into a craze and jumping in momentum that's going to have a profound impact. One person, not that big, but when you have tens, hundreds, thousands, that adds up and that swings the purchases, the bid orders on those websites quickly. We do have some movement in the chat here. I do love the typos for Mr. Mush and, and Oprah. Yeah, when, when you have personalities, celebrities going on the news promoting coins, it also feeds into that momentum. There have been some legal actions, enforcement actions brought against people for market manipulation, but with this being a new space and not neatly falling into the CFTC or the SEC's purview, just they're one, trying to figure out what it all means. Congress hasn't written it into law yet and they need to, so there's a clear framework, but there aren't the same protections, just like the 1920s. It's a buyer, it's a investor beware market. You can come in, you can play, but there's no safe rails. It's a wild west until we have some of those basic things in place. And a lot of that will fall on Congress because regulators don't have the authority to write the laws themselves. They can just pursue uh, regulation through enforcement for the laws they have. Let's see, so we have thoughts on some allocations of round percent in the portfolio. Um, how would the custody work? Do you say ledger? So actually that's one good point to talk on because Greg, we did have some remarks on just asset allocation in general. Um, after Paul Tudor Jones did an interview a few years back, you know, 2% really got bounced around the markets as a, a part for investing. One casual thought to it was we lose 2% of value in a portfolio and don't blink an eye. I mean, taxes go up, inflation moves a, a little blip and you can have that sort of movement. So in that sense, your overall risk exposure could be minimal, but you also do get asymmetric upside if that trend continues. So you could have that 2% deliver a considerable return. I'm not in love with 2% and there's a lot of research that still needs to go into that, but it is a good starting point for those conversations. And I expect it to evolve over time. If Fidelity's Bitcoin announcement has any traction, it's very possible. MicroStrategy might go all in, but other plans and fiduciaries could adopt a very, like they could adopt Bitcoin or approve it for access in their, in their plan. But at the same time, they could all say, hey, there's a lot that's unknown. We're only allowing up to one or 2% as a, a protection for what is unknown. And if someone were to go that route, detail everything, you know, have a very clear communication on why you're doing it, also what you don't know and how to do it responsibly. So it 
that way, one, you're doing everything you can for your or those you represent, but also you're covering your bases because, I mean, you all know better than I do. Being a fiduciary can be a very hard job. Sometimes a lose-lose job. They love you when you do. They love you when they don't. And, and Nick, one of the things too, the, 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 the consultant in me can't help myself, but but make the point. And we made this this point was made on one of the earlier slides. We talked about the different institutions investing in, in adopting um, allocations to crypto. It is it, there's a lot of variation by client type, and I think that will continue to always be the case because a lot of client bases are sensitive to what their peers are doing, right? So, for example, a high net worth investor may be less interested in what a public pension fund is doing but a public pension fund is probably more likely to be sensitive to what others are doing within that space. And, and that's something that we think about too when we talk to our, talk to our clients and recognizing that, that not only do we wanna make the right decision for individual clients and portfolios, but a lot of cases, some sensitivity to what, to what the, their peers are doing as well. So again, we talk a lot in Marquette about customized portfolios and customized solutions, and this is just kind of another element of that conversation. But um, I'm gonna jump back out here and let you go through the rest of the Q&A you've gotten. Mr. Hangan, I, I'm sorry, I missed part of your question. In terms of valuations, if you go back to this, if we, if you have a chance to review the the deck later on in the day or the month, um, go back to the side on intrinsic value because use case is where it all starts on valuing something. Um, if you all want a comparison, or if anybody here does want to dabble in space because you see the sort of thrill that got you in this space to begin with, um, think of Pets.com versus Amazon. At the time when the internet was coming out, if we knew which was going to be Pets.com, we wouldn't have had the internet bubble. It's not that easy, but hindsight's 2020. Looking at the use case, the demographics it can serve, whether it's in the US or globally, and then looking at these networks in terms of users, sustained adoption, development, who's investing in them and backing them, all of those things can help inform the decision. It's not gonna be precise. It's not gonna be anywhere near as precise as we're accustomed to with our current uh, investment vehicles, like debt instruments or an equity looking at cash flows. But some of these networks do have some sort of cash flow in them. And they also have companies adopting them. So you could have a mix of consumer adoption, commercial adoption, or sovereign. CBDCs do need to work on some of these networks to be interoperable. So there's a lot of things that factor into it. But I just said, keep it simple. Use case, the network adoption, sustained development. Start there and you kind of build your way out. Hey, Nick, can I jump back in here and ask you another question? Talking about, I mean... At this point, we've really been talking about investing in the actual cryptocurrencies, right? But a conversation we have with some clients too is maybe the volatility in the relative immaturity and the regulatory concerns about actually a Bitcoin investment or an Ethereum investment. That's not really comfortable for some clients or investors. But hey, the underlying technology, blockchain technology, I don't think anyone has any doubt that that technology is here to stay. It will be further leveraged across industries. You're already seeing it in the broader finance world. You're seeing it uh, you know, in the healthcare. You're seeing it in other record-keeping type operations. Spend a minute talking about how the blockchain technology is certainly here to stay. And what we're seeing some investors do is they're playing crypto indirectly by investing in, in blockchain companies or blockchain technology. So there's a number of ways investors are playing it. Um, there's a lot of ETFs that are rolling out of the for the public companies, and then also some private equity um, funds of funds that focus on the private and public companies that are developing these blockchains, the ones that they can invest in. It's a narrow market, but it's getting better in, in real time. I think Goldman Sachs was looking at uh, launching some sort of blockchain uh, fund that relied on the DeFi aspect. Um, there are some companies like there's one out in texas some, some guys i know there they've been delightful idx digital assets they provide some valuation benchmarks for standard and poor's but they also run their own DeFi index that's investable through private placements and they kind of hedge it a bit so they'll do DeFi directly but they'll also look at the companies that underpin all of these networks and they have some companies and some of the products out there do have robust frameworks for and met uh, methodologies for who goes into these vehicles um Another interesting development has been how people have played it, not only from investing in the companies, but globally, how they've played different vehicles. The US currently doesn't have a spot ETF, but Canada, Australia, Germany, Switzerland, they do. So some banks have given family or have afforded access to family offices or accredited investors through global brokerages. And that's one reason Fidelity has moved their digital assets arm to Canada was there was a regulatory framework that was conducive where they could operate. and. You kind of have to go abroad, sadly, to look at some of these vehicles, but there, there are ETFs, there are ETNs, there are ETPs on both the companies and spot-based instruments for actual cryptos. 
Nick, do you have further questions in, in the chat? Um, so that one sat still. Um, I think this chat's in a good place. Nothing rolling in at the moment. So why don't I ask you a couple of questions which we, we get from our clients uh, in, in kind of direct conversations with them as it relates to, to crypto. And you touched upon hot storage, cold storage, but maybe to more explicitly ask the question, can someone steal your crypto? Can someone steal my crypto? And then if it's stolen, is it gone forever? Is there any way to get it back? Uh, to me, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of computer code. And it's, like you said, there, there's no tangible asset behind this, right? So how can I, if it's stolen, how can I recover it? So I'll answer on all three aspects of this. Short answer is yes. Someone can steal crypto just so they can take your wallet. Um, they can rob a bank. Those things can happen. It's an unfortunate part of the markets. Um, while it's possible, blockchain networks that are decentralized, the decentralized ones haven't been hacked. It's always the centralized exchanges that do get hacked where stuff can get stolen. Um, it can be recovered. A lot of people thought it, every once it was gone, it was finalized. Um, Chain Analysis, the company that provided some of the data for our crime stats, they're partnered with regulators, the Department of Justice across 70 different countries, Interpol, and they helped recover the 2.3 part of the two uh, the millions paid in the colonial pipeline hack. So it can be traced, it can be found, and regulators are getting better at it every day. Um, there was a couple that, I want to say they're called the Lichstein couple out in Europe. They were arrested. Um, they were trying to launder about 120,000 Bitcoin that were stolen in a hack in 2016. Stuff that we thought was gone and dust in the wind. Leveraging the blockchain, FBI working with Interpol, crazy, tracked them down. It's valued at $4.5 billion today. That's a lot of funds that now can be returned back to the system, back to the network, or to the victims of that theft. To prevent it, using hot and cold storage is, is always a way to go. But then if you were to choose a custodian, such as Coinbase or Fidelity or any of the different names, there's a whole list I have of them. You want to make sure that there's a robust insurance policy that covers hacks, and most do. Most at least have hack insurance as a minimum. And you want to make sure that it's a, a leading name, one that has invested in the infrastructure and security that you might see from uh, online banking. Nick, I know as we planned through the kind of the, the last couple of minutes of this presentation and, and addressing some questions that clients asked, we, we, we plan to talk about asset allocation. We already done that a little bit. I want to talk about taxes for a minute and how digital assets are taxed. I, I think we have a blend of, of institutional as well as some high net worth here on the call. And perhaps people are just kind of want to dabble in this with their own, their own personal portfolios. So how do they tax digital assets? So they crypto assets, or the IRS calls them virtual currencies. That's their buzzword for them. Um, I think the notice was 2014-21. Um, they're considered property, so they're subject to long and short-term capital gains, and it's all sales. Unless they're held in an IRA, which there are out there, but there's not many. Unless they're held in an IRA, they do not qualify for like-kind exchange exceptions. So if you convert it, you sell it, you have that's when your tax is realized you, on the difference. If you lose money, which some companies have started leveraging this, some people harvest losses out of it, so they they benefit on the way down and then they benefit on the way up because those things haven't been refined yet. The code on digital assets is pretty thin. With that, if you are worried about the taxing or the accounting piece, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, that's a mouthful, and the Chartered Institute of Management Accountants have released um, some practitioner guides. You can find them online and there's some rough guidelines on where to consider it in your balance sheet, how to, well, I guess just record it. And then from there, I would seek out an accountant that's familiar with the space to see what your options are in terms of taxes, deductions, stuff like that. And last question to wrap up with before uh, final comments. There is, by and large, institutional investors haven't done too much yet, right? And I, I think there's still some, that like, for some reasons we talked about, right, the volatility and maturity, the regulatory concerns. Don't know when that answer, I think it's always an evolving answer. But fast forward 10 or 20 years, let, let's make the leap here that institutional money gets flowed into the crypto market, right? How will the crypto market be impacted? In other words, how does institutional money change the crypto market as we look forward from this point? Looking just at economic principles, um, I, I sound like a dead horse, uh, beating, beating a drum or kicking a dead horse. The shallow markets part is key there. Institutional money is what's is one thing that stabilizes the network. So as money flows in, the 
bids and asks, the purchases and sales of crypto assets are better absorbed. They're not as influential on the price. So as institutions and new vehicles, investment vehicles roll out, I expect volatility to mute to dampen. I don't know to what degree it will, but given where we're at, it can only get better from where we're at going off the chart with volatility. Um, the other part of that is I would expect it to be another part of both primary and secondary markets. You could see um, trade trading desks pop up in banks, one for the secondary market aspect. It could also come across a lot of banks as it has to redo the infrastructure of our markets to reduce costs, to uh, reduce settlement time, all those little things that were kind of like, man, we're still in 1977, but it's 2022. I would expect that to be a big part of the conversation and adoption as well. Excellent. Well, we're, we're top of the hour. I, I want to thank uh, two different parties here. For all of you who joined us, thank you very much for spending the hour with us. I hope it's been a good use of your time and you've learned something. And then I'd like to thank Nick. Nick, Nick, you're our expert on this topic. We're lucky to have you. We're, we're we're thrilled that you like doing these types of events. I have the easy job. I can just get to ask the questions. I sit back and listen. And every time we go through one of these together, Nick, I, I take away something new. So thank you very much. A recording of this will be available. If you have further questions that we are not able to, to cover Real on the recording, please quick. let us know. Yep. Everybody ahead. that's still on the line, I want to thank you all for your time. It's the greatest gift you can give anyone. Marquette and I don't take it lightly. We appreciate it. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to your consultants or directly to us at any time. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.